Hello, everyone, and welcome to our kickoff event for 92nd Street Y's campaign for 100%. I'm Julie Mayshak, Director of Global Programs in 92nd Street Y's Belfer Center for Innovation and Social Impact. As part of our landmark initiative, the Campaign for 100%, from now until Election Day, we will be bringing you an amazing lineup of virtual events on voting and what changes when more people participate in democracy. Please visit 92y.org forward slash campaign for 100% for more. We are so excited to kick off the campaign with our incredible event this evening. Before we get started, 92Y would like to thank the Jack Brooks Foundation for making tonight's event possible. Please join me now in welcoming Jeb Brooks from the foundation to share a few words. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's discussion, which is part of the 92nd Street Wise Campaign for 100%. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Jack Brooks Foundation, and it is truly an honor to be part of a campaign that reflects our foundation's primary initiative, which is for everyone to vote in every election. Tonight's conversation will explore an important issue facing our country, participation in the voting process. In order for America to form a more perfect union, we need everybody's voice. In many ways, your vote is your voice, and the best place for your voice to be heard is from within the ballot box. To support the 92nd Streetwise campaign for 100%, the Jack Brooks Foundation has launched its Help America Vote Challenge, which will identify and support small, local, and creative groups to improve voter turnout where they are by solving any voting problems from within their own community. My father raised me under one philosophy. You ought to be interested in helping people, but you ought to be interested in helping everybody. And you can learn more about Chairman Brooks's enduring legacy in his biography, The Meanest Man in Congress, Jack Brooks and the Making of an American Century, published by New South Books. Please stay connected with us and learn more about the Foundation's initiatives by visiting us at jackbrooksfoundation.org. And now, we invite you to join today's conversation entitled, If Everyone Voted. Thank you again to Jeb Brooks and the Jack Brooks Foundation for the support of Campaign for 100%. And now, it is my honor to introduce our guests this evening, joining us here on 92nd Street Wise virtual stage. I can't thank them enough for taking time from their incredibly busy schedules this election season to be here with us this evening. Just a quick note before we get started, we will be taking questions tonight. We have viewers joining us across a variety of platforms. Uh, please know that each platform has a section for comments, regardless of where you're watching. If you leave your questions in the comment section, it will get to us. And now, uh, please join me in welcoming our guests this evening. Uh, Janae Nelson, Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She has testified before Congress on voter suppression, algorithmic bias, bias, and in support of the Voting Rights Advancement Act. Kim Whaley, law professor, author, lawyer, and former CBS News legal analyst. Her most recent book is entitled, What You Need to Know About Voting, and why. Maria Teresa Kumar is an American activist, social entrepreneur, and founding president of Voto Latino, a key civic engagement organization registering 500,000 plus voters. She's also Emmy nominated MSNBC contributor. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Trevor Potter is founder and president of Campaign Legal Center. Trevor worked as general counsel for John McCain's 2000 and 2008 presidential campaigns and previously served as a Republican chairman of the Federal Election Commission. And our moderator this evening is E.J. Dion. He is syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, university professor in the Foundation of Democracy and Culture at Georgetown University, and visiting professor at Harvard University. His most recent book is called Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save Our Country. 
Thank you all for being here. And EJ, over to you. Well, thank you so much. And I can't say uh, how high an honor it is to be with these great people. I admire every single person on this panel, which is a very lucky thing for me. And I also <laughs> want to salute the uh, 92nd Street Y, which is just an extraordinary uh, institution. Every democracy needs a thoughtful conversation and dialogue. And the 92nd Street Y has for a very long time been a headquarters and a warm welcoming home for that sort of conversation. Uh, we don't have enough of it in our country. And so I say thank you uh, to the 92nd Street Y. And I love the title of our uh, event tonight. If everybody voted, I thought I might kind of walk on the stage of Fiddler on the Roof. You'll remember if I were a rich man, I wonder if this aspiration, if we might sing out the aspiration if everyone voted. Um, I'm just going to begin, since I'm the moderator, I am not going to express a lot of views, but I just want to offer four thoughts on what would happen if everybody voted. If everybody voted, campaigns would have to appeal to all voters and not just those uh, the campaigns decided are likely voters. How would that change things? If everyone voted, young people would bulk much larger in the electorate than they do uh, today. Uh, that would make our politics almost by definition more forward looking. If everyone voted, rich and poor and Americans of every race would be equally represented in the most fundamental step uh, in our democracy. That would make an extraordinary difference. And last, if everyone voted, we would actually live up to the words of our Declaration of Independence that a government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. We would get consent of all of the governed. Uh, I'd just like to shout out Kim, who had a wonderful line on this. Voting is the fulcrum of anything else we care about when it comes to government solutions in a democratic republic. So without further ado, I want to jump right in and indeed jump right in in an election year that is very challenged. Um, it's challenged by a pandemic. It's challenged by a voting system that is not ready, uh, necessarily ready for all the mail ballots. It's challenged by claims um, by the president in particular that this may not be a legitimate election. Uh, Janae, what do we need to know specifically about voting during a pandemic? And how do you assess where we are right now? Uh, well, thank you for that question. There's so many challenges to vote that we face, but the upshot is that we also have more options and opportunities to cast a ballot than we ever have before. Uh, there's no time in the history of this country that absentee ballot and vote by mail has been as widely available as it is now. Of course, the circumstances that led us here are ones that are you know, quite unfortunate uh, and have fallen on the shoulders of particular communities. But we know that with the right preparedness and information that this election can be successful, that voters can have access to the ballot. And what we're encouraging everyone to do is to have a plan. In fact, have a plan A, B, and C on how you can cast a ballot. We're able and uh, willing to do so, doing it in person is the most secure method, uh, but vote by mail is also secure and there are many options, including drop boxes, um, and uh, you know, getting to the election site before election day during the early voting period to drop a ballot off without crowds um, at your local precinct. Um, there are many ways in which we can navigate this pandemic and still honor our constitutional right to vote. Could I just follow up with you quickly? What groups do we need to most worry about uh, in terms of having their access to the ballot uh, limited or denied in this period? And what can we do about that? Well, historically marginalized communities uh, and anyone who is suffering from particular health threats are, are more at risk than any other population. Uh, African-Americans and Latinx persons are three times as likely to contract COVID than whites they're two times as likely to die from COVID. So in addition to the historical voter suppression that 
often is visited upon those communities in particular, the added layer of the threat of COVID makes that more concerning. It's also a challenge for people who are not as able-bodied as others and for young people and elderly people who are at risk. So we have a number of populations that will have specific and particular challenges this election, but they can be navigated with adequate preparation and with the support of civil rights organizations and many others who are investing in the protection of our democracy and the production of the right to vote. Bless you, thank you. And I know you're doing a lot of work to guarantee that. And I, I really appreciate that. I wanted to go to Kim, your view on the biggest challenge uh, this fall, but I have an almost uh, double backflip kind of worry in all this, which is that we are talking so much about the potential problems that we may so doubt in the minds of voters in ways that's actually counterproductive, uh, that uh, will begin to rationalize uh, the arguments of those saying there's something wrong with the process or may scare people away uh, from the process. So what do you see as the biggest challenge and how do we reassure people that, hey, this can actually work and your ballot can count? You know, thanks. Um, as, as you might know, my, I actually came into this topic as a constitutional scholar and law professor for a long time. So my concern really is post November 3rd, I do think, as Janae indicates, we're going to see a massive turnout, which I think is wonderful. And there's so much discussion about the systems of voting, the fact that it really depends on your zip code, that it's state by state, that changes are being made and challenged in the 11th hour in a pandemic, and people are learning about the process. Um, but but as, I, as you indicated in your quote, having studied the constitution for a long time, um, the Supreme Court itself backs into the voting question into let's, let's the, let the electorate decide this many, many times in terms of making decisions under the constitution. And my concern, frankly, is that the, the electoral process and the constitution itself and democracy itself is the, the foundations of that could be shaken if after the third, there's a lot of questions about the validity of the election and the validity of the winner. That is people that support Joe Biden, if he doesn't end up in the White House on January 20th, they'll believe the election was somehow flawed. If people support uh, Donald Trump, he doesn't stay in the White House on January 20th, the election is flawed. flawed. In addition, that there will be um, you know a lot of lawsuits, potential recounts, questions on counting, challenges to the legitimacy of voting in a pandemic, all of that, that goes to undermine the institution itself of voting and democracy in America. And I think Americans tend, and I know this from my students, you know, talking to young people a lot, they tend to assume American democracy is a given, uh, that it's our birthright, we'll wake up, no matter what happens on Janu in January 20th, we will wake up and the, the wheels of American democracy will hum along and I can sit back or participate as much as I want. We will always be a beacon of uh, we the people, that is, we are the bosses of our own government. And I think it's that uh, fallacy that that I that I that I've been trying to uh, sort of emphasize now for several years, not just around voting, but also in connection with what we saw with the Mueller investigation, et cetera. And so that's really my concern. What happens after November 30th? Do we have a president that takes the oath of office on January 20th, which which has to happen under the United States Constitution? That's a you know deadline. Um, it, will we be able to move on as a country in an integrated way? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to get back to that in particular. I'd like to get back to the question of how might we speed the count? I may ask you, when I get to you, uh, Trevor, I know you have some particular thoughts of reforms, but I'd like you to sort of think about ways we can speed the count, because I think the longer the count goes, the easier it is will be to demagogue the count. But Maria Teresa, I'd like to bring you in next. Uh, this is um, a Latinx Heritage Month. Um, and you have been um, working very hard to mobilize Latinx voters. Um, how can you talk about what you see happening in the Latinx community, what you're doing and others are doing to mobilize uh, this vote? 
Yeah. First of all, thanks for having this conversation and having it early so that we could actually make adjustments and we could actually address the issues. Uh, most folks don't realize that most voter registration happens right after Labor Day. That's when we go whole hog. People are paying attention to the politics. The politicians are knocking on their doors. And I think that with under the pandemic, we've had to reimagine what electoral work looks like. Uh, that said, at Voto Latino, because we're a digital first organization, uh, EJ, we have not lost a beat under this pandemic. We are now, as of this morning, we have now registered over 299,961 voters. And I say that because the 961 voters count as much as the first voter we registered. Every single vote counts. Uh, under the pandemic, we've been fortunate enough to, because again, we're digital first, we've trained over 5,000 volunteers and have contacted over 800,000 low propensity voters in five key states. If you were to ask me, is there an enthusiasm in the Latino community? There is. The biggest challenge that we have in Latino participation is not the registered voter, where in fact we find that 79% of registered vote Latino voters go out and vote, despite the fact that 49% of them who are registered never get a political contact from a candidate or from the party. What our biggest challenge in the Latino community is, is closing the voter registration gap. For the very first time, we keep hearing that Latinos are gonna be the second largest demographic of Americans eligible to vote. But of the 32 million eligible voters, 15 million of us are not registered, EJ, 15 million. And of that 15 million, 10 million of them are under the age of 33, 4 million of them who have come of age since the last election. And that's where we focus our work. If you're to ask me what are the what is encouraging is that when we ask them to register, they do. What is discouraging is the fact that there are so many unknowns in how the process is going to go. And how do we demystify the vote by mail process for folks that can vote in different states? We know that 75% of Latinos are concerned about voting under COVID. We also know that 59% of them have never voted by vote by mail. And it's very similar to what we see in our African-American brothers and sisters is that there's a distrust of the mail system if they can't see their ballot actually physically going into the ballot box. And so one of the programs that we're launching is to talk about the different ways that people can vote, whether it's vote by mail, whether it's voting early uh, by standing in line, but making sure that they are protected. I also don't though, EJ, you, you raised two really th important uh, uh, flags that as organizations, we have to be very cautious of. After the gutting of the Voting Rights Act back in 2013, all of our organizations, Voto Latino included, were you know, jumping up in town and telling the community how they were disenfranchised because of it. And what we saw were people staying home because they thought that voting was already hard and that all of a sudden it became harder. So all of us basically changed the way we reimagined our communications and made it more of a matter of fact. So now you're in Texas, you're gonna need to X, Y, Z. And we learned that by giving people information in a matter of fact way while they while others battled it in the courts, it gave people agency to cast that ballot. And our job right now is to give people agency and say, you can, you can participate in this election, whether it's vote by mail, whether it's voting early, whether making sure that you are protected and you stand in line, but making sure that people have the tools and the information they need so that they can cast the ballot the best of their ability. My second flag and my second concern is what you were alluding to, is that everybody is primed to call the election on November 3rd. And we have to recognize that we have to get the public ready to give everybody space to make sure that every single vote that was cast before the election is counted properly. The only way that's going to work though, is that Secretary of States across the country, regardless of party, have to be on board. They can't politicize the count. And that is where we have to have conversations with folks on the Democratic side and on the Republican side and recognizing that the integrity of our elections is what we have. Uh, the professor mentioned it, but it's also the delegitimizing of the elections that the Russian interference is most concerned with. They recognize that the, mo when the moment that you start seeding doubt in the integrity of our elections among, among the American public, that's all they need to delegitimize the rest of our institutions. And so I encourage the secretaries of state to really be thoughtful, to allow them to do the work that also at the same time, give them the moment to breathe, but also speak straight to the American public that it's not gonna be declared on November 3rd, give it space to breathe and not to call any elections because that would be irresponsible. 
Thank you so much. I, I, I'm really glad you uh, raised the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, uh, because I think that is something we should talk about here. Also, just the psychological sense of dropping a paper in the ballot box. Um, I, I know when I voted in the primary, I walked over to a mailbox just to have the feeling that I was dropping a ballot into mm -hmm. something. Um, <laughs> I have every reason to believe it was counted, but I felt better dropping it in uh, right. my charge there. Um, Trevor, um, I want to sort of go two places with you. You have been a reformer all your life um, and have really fought for some of the most important election reforms, including the McCain-Feingold Act, back when it was possible to do political reform in a bipartisan way. Imagine that. Um, I'm wondering if you ever think that's going to be possible again. I guess as long as you're alive, it will be. Um, what... Um, what sort of one reform do you think would make a real difference here? And how do you imagine our dealing with some of these problems, whether speeding the count, making people um, uh, patient about getting a result? Um, but what is your one reform that you want to sort of put on the table and get everyone on this call fighting for? Uh, thanks so much, EJ. Um, I'm glad to be with you all. Um, I, I would start by saying in a very heartfelt way, that, that I have genuinely been shocked by what we have seen this year. Uh, as John McCain's lawyer through a series of campaigns, uh, I just cannot believe that the official Republican Party position from Washington, from the RNC and the, the uh, Trump campaign and its lawyers all across the country, is effectively we want to make it as hard as possible to vote. Uh, that is not a Republican position that, that has any tradition in the party, um, the party of, of uh, Lincoln and the, the, the party of uh, uh, ultimately uh, many votes for the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. The 14th and 15th Amendments, God help us. <laughs> and, and the right to vote to natural born Americans. So uh, it, it is disturbing. And, and my organization, the Campaign Legal Center, is in court all over the country now uh, trying to make it easier to vote, make it safe to vote in the middle of a pandemic. And we are facing attacks uh, by lawyers representing uh, the National Committee or the Trump campaign trying to make it harder. And, and so I, I really I am just distressed but shocked by this. Uh, and, and that goes to your question, EJ, of, of can we have bipartisanship here? I, I think that there are lots of Republicans, lots of Republican election lawyers and Republican officials in the states. Uh, the point made about secretaries of states and election officials is true. They want this election to go well. Uh, and they want it to be efficiently run. They want it to be an election where every vote is counted uh, and, and is cast in a way that it can be counted. Uh, and, and so I, I, um, I think the points that, that were made earlier by uh, uh, Maria Trezeza and uh, by Janae are, are correct, that this is an opportunity this year for more people than ever before to vote in, in ways that should be easier, but it's not going to be simple. Uh, we are winning many of these court cases. There will be more uh, states, the, a huge number of states now that allow no excuse absentee voting because of the uh, pandemic largely. Some of them have said it's only for one year. Some of them have said we're just going to change the rules. But it will be possible for people to do that. Uh, and, and it's important, I think, that we are clear that this is going to be, for those who vote by mail, absentee, a new venture for many, many Americans. And, and it requires education. It requires paying attention to the ballot because voting by mail is not the same as walking in uh, being handed a ballot, filling it out, and putting it in a machine. But one obvious example is uh, that most states require that absentee voters sign their signature on the exterior of the uh, outside ballot, and then that signature is compared to the file, and when they're the same, then they open the exterior ballot, and the secret ballot is inside in a separate envelope. So nobody knows how they voted, but the key thing is you have to get through that initial barrier of having your ballot come back and have it been identified as a legitimate ballot from a registered voter with a signature that matches. And I mention this because one of the things we've seen in the primaries 
is that a number of voters did not sign their absentee ballots. Yeah. Uh, they filled them out, put them in the envelope and mailed them. And in some states, that means the ballot will literally be thrown away. It will be untouched. In other states, the state will make the effort to see the name on the outside of the envelope, contact the voter, say you didn't sign your ballot, uh, can you come in and do so, which is hard in a pandemic, is there some other way to certify that this is you? So th the fact that people can vote absentee is really helpful in a pandemic. People who are at home uh, don't want to be uh, in a crowded environment, uh, but it also has the, the risk that you're asking people to do something they haven't done before uh, and may not find simple to do for the very first time. And so encouraging voters to carefully read the instructions and fill it out uh, is, is really vital this year. The second point you asked about EJ is, is there a way to ensure that mail-in ballots, absentee ballots are counted quicker than we saw in many of the primaries. And you need to remember that there are some states in this country, we're now up to five or six, that automatically do basically a mail-in system. And they've grown very efficient at it. So it started with Washington and Oregon, and it now includes Utah and Colorado and Hawaii and California this year is doing a mail-in system. And so, but those earlier states have got it down to a science. They have machines that count these votes quickly. Uh, they have citizens who are used to doing it. And they have a system where they prepare the ballots to be counted ahead of time. So they don't actually count them. There, there has been a principle pretty much across the country that you don't want to count results before the polls have closed because you don't want those results to leak. But they take out the outer envelopes, they compare the signatures, they contact the voters if there's a question about the signature. They put the ballots in a pile where they can easily be counted on election night, and then they run them through the machine. So in some states, we're going to see quick results. Other states, and I would cite as an example, New York and the primaries, they were overwhelmed. They're not used to having many absentee voters. They have normally required an excuse. And as a result, they didn't have the high-speed machines. They weren't opening the ballots and sorting them out until election day or election night. And it was a slow process. And the danger for us, uh, and, and, and this, this is a point that Kim emphasized, the danger is that if it turns out, as seems likely based on the polling data we have so far, that the majority of Republicans don't use an absentee ballot because uh, the, uh, of all of Trump's attacks on them and they think there's something wrong with them. So they vote in person. And then a majority of Democrats use an absentee ballot uh, because they've been encouraged to do so and it's an easy way to vote at home. If that happens, there's a real risk that on election night, the first returns coming in will be the ones from the people who voted in person. And if those are predominantly Republican, there is a threat that President Trump can say, hey, I won, it's 10 o'clock, the polls have closed, uh, I'm ahead, and all these other votes that are coming in and being counted are somehow illegitimate. Now they're not illegitimate, they are just as legitimate as any vote cast in person. But that's the risk and the reason it is important that we have speedy vote counting uh, of all these mail-in ballots. And some states are changing their laws uh, to enable the sort of things that Oregon and Washington already do, which is to prepare the ballots ahead of time so they can be counted quickly. There's a battle right now going on in Pennsylvania between the legislature and the governor where the legislature is proposing earlier uh, uh, preparation of ballots, but they're also proposing a number of other things to make it harder to cast those absentee ballots. And so the governor is, is, is fighting it. But at the end of the day, EJ, the question of what's the one thing we can do is post-election. We aren't gonna do it now, but post-election, uh, we need to look at all of these issues, figure out how to not only make it easier to vote, easier to register, but give citizens greater confidence in the system and in their access to it, the equal access that we are entitled to constitutionally. And there is a piece of legislation known as HR1 uh, that was put together in the House, it has passed the House, and it has many of the reforms that 
I think would make a real difference. Redistricting reform so that you don't have gerrymandering and the party in power can't control the system and dictate the result. Uh, a repair of the Voting Rights Act and Section 5, which you referred to, to ensure that minority communities are again protected. It has ethics reforms, it has campaign finance reforms. So I think post-election, if there is a majority in Congress to really make some changes, there is already a legislative vehicle ready uh, that can be used. But first we have to get through uh, November 3rd and the sorts of crises we've been talking about. I want to, I hope we can bring back uh, Janae. Uh, the, she was having trouble earlier on her connection. I hope we can bring her back. Um, I, there is some, on the, among the questions uh, from the audience, um, I just want you to keep this one in the back of your head, Trevor, uh, which is uh, somebody wanted to know what specifically are the Republicans doing to make it harder for people to vote, but I don't want to go there right away. And I really appreciated what you said I, I, about ways we can speed up the count because I think there are things that can be done and I think that'll be very important. Um, but someone else asked a question, how do you respond to people who say voting is not important? Um, and I'd like to append to that a, a, a question um, that really is where we started. Um, I suggested a bunch of reasons why I think it would make a real difference um, if everyone voted or if turnout were 80 or you know, closer to 80 percent than where we are uh, now. Um, how do you respond to that? Maybe I can start with Kim, because your your famous quote is all about if you don't care about elections, you're not going to have much influence on policy of any kind. Um, yeah, well, there's a, there are a number of responses to that. Um, one is, I think, has to do with civic education. Um, the Annenberg Center for the last 10 years has done a poll and only a third of Americans can even name all three branches of government. In um, 2015, there was a poll done of recent college graduates, 10% thought that Judge Judy was on the United States Supreme Court. Um, and if, if, if people don't understand how the system actually works, it's really hard for them to understand the importance of, of participating in the system. For example, I, you know, I teach law students, a lot of um, a number of them will say, listen, you know, it's all a bunch of older people. They don't reflect my concerns. I really care about climate change, for example. And that's just not something that anyone is serious about. So there's no one there that represents me. Um, meanwhile, the Trump administration has pulled over a hundred environmentally related regulations. And I would, how many people really understand what an executive branch agency actually does. That is, they make law. Um, hey, Janae. Yeah. They make laws. The president picks who's in charge of these agencies, even though they function as almost like mini Congresses. The Supreme Court has said that's constitutional, but they make environmental laws. They enforce environmental laws. So just a basic primer in that level of education. I think that's number one. Number two is, and I find this in speaking more to sort of uh, younger people on the progressive side of things is, is for them to understand, and this, this is what I mentioned earlier, the privilege of American democracy. The idea that there are millions of people across the globe um, who would literally give their lives or go to prison for the ability to actually choose their, elector, their uh, elected officials in a free and fair electoral process. And our people that came before us um, did that as well. And to understand in this conversation around being uh, mindful of privilege, to, to respect the privilege of that, I think is, is um, absolutely critical. Uh, it's, it's also, I think, meeting voters and people understanding that there are down ballots. Part of it is how we have the conversation around presidents and presidents. And it is really critical, as I indicated. I mean, and this sounds might sound partisan, but I, I do really think the guardrails of democracy across the board, the other mechanisms for holding officials accountable for abuses have fallen the, 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 the separation of powers, the notion that the other two branches grade the president's papers, that has fallen. So, so or is falling, voting really is it in terms of protecting the right to, to a democracy by we the people in America. This, this November election is absolutely vital as a matter of constitutional principles. However, um, I don't think people understand, for example, there are district attorneys on the ballot. So the, the Philadelphia district attorney has taken some heat recently, but, but 
but he ran on a no cash bail for low, uh, you know, misdemeanor type crimes. I mean, that is something that affects people in their lives on a day to day basis. So it's identifying sort of where people are in their lives and then sort of going to voting from that standpoint rather than lecturing them at why it's so important every election cycle, you better vote. It's kind of a around the year round uh, in between election cycle conversation. Um, judges are on the ballot. Sheriffs are on the ballot. Um, and I, I know we might get to this earlier and we talked about the Voting Rights Act a little bit, um, but the idea that we're seeing a lot of mobilization, you know, Black Lives Matter movements, but translating that into something that really is meaningful um, does require elected politicians to actually make decisions that are consistent with what uh, the electorate wants. Um, that's how change is made. And I don't think a lot people who stay home uh, make that concrete connection in their mind. So 50% approximately of, of Americans vote. Um, and the notion is, you know, if you want policy to change and you stay home, there's a hundred percent chance that you're, that nothing's going to change. I mean, that, that connection that's that's that is, is really accurate. Um, and one other thing I, 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 wanna, say, we, I just just to close down because yeah. I want to bring other people in. Okay. I'm so glad you mentioned down ballot, by the way, sheriffs, DAs, that's so important that people don't even think about very much. Go ahead. Just cl uh, close off because I want to move on, uh, get other people in before we go. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, the last point I want to make is about income inequality, how, you know, high income uh, people tend to vote more than low income people. We've seen the gap just yawn in the last 40 years, but the who is actually voting is not changing. That is low income people are less likely to vote. So if people want to see uh, policies that actually impact regular people, financial, economic policies, we need to see more people vote and participate in that process and give those people a voice. I want to put a couple other questions on the table, but I want everybody to have in the back of their heads that question, why is it important? Why would it make a difference? if everybody voted in Janae, uh, also uh, to reflect on, um, you know, people died in order to get the right to vote. And they under John, we celebrated John Lewis's life recently. Um, and they weren't crazy in their demand for voting. They weren't wrong. They did not believe voting was unimportant and they had good reason to believe that. But I also want to go to um, you know, various reforms, making voting a holiday, voting over a longer period, uh, employing new approaches. And Janae, and uh, I should sort of uh, truth in packaging here for the audience, Janae and Mar Maria Teresa were part of a working group that I was part of, a shout out to our friend Miles Rappaport, who co-chaired it, where we suggested universal civic duty voting along the lines of what they have in Australia. Uh, and other countries, actually other democracies around the world, where by requiring people to vote, you actually shift all the rules in the system because suddenly the system has to be oriented to helping you do your civic duty. It sort of is the biggest sort of pushback against voter suppression. Um, Janae and uh, Maria Teresa, uh, 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 Trevor threw out some reforms where would you go with uh, reform and in, proce in the process, answer some of these uh, questions about why voting matters? Uh, Janae, I'll go to you first. Great, thank you so much. Um, it sounds like I missed part of a very rich discussion. Um, you know, I'll start with the issue of, of why voting matters and you uh, reminded us of the legacy of John Lewis. And it's important that we remember, particularly for certain groups in this country, and namely African-Americans, the right to vote was never delivered through law, through policy, without a fight and without violence. Um, and that legacy of our country is one that we are still living through today. These new obstacles of voter suppression are just a new manifestation of the efforts to keep the electorate among a certain group of people, both racially and in terms of wealth and in terms of politics. The Legal Defense Fund is a nonpartisan organization. And so our focus is ensuring that African-Americans are able to vote regardless of the state that they live in, whether it's considered a battleground state or a, a, a purpling state or a swing state. It's the fundamental right to vote that is critical. 
And voting matters for the very reasons that the Supreme Court said back in 1886 in a case called Yick Woe versus Hopkins, when the Supreme Court stated the right to vote is fundamental because it is preservative of all rights. If we don't have the right to vote, if we don't have the agency to elect our elected officials, to hold them accountable by voting them out of office, by uh, engaging in ballot initiatives to change the laws when we believe they are unjust as the voters of Florida did in 2018 when they passed Amendment 4 to change the constitution of that state to allow its returning citizens to regain their right to vote, then we lose our power and we lose other rights, economic, social, et cetera, political. Um, so the voting matters in, in critical ways. It is just the entry point to civic engagement in our democracy. Uh, and there are many ways in which even the outcomes of elections can be undermined as we see in Florida uh, and the same issue of Amendment 4 that I mentioned where an appellate court just recently issued a negative decision undoing the will of the voters. Um, but the point is that voting is, is just the, it's the currency that we all possess equally. Um, regardless of income or race or ethnicity or language barrier or ability, we each have a right to vote that can be cast uh, on an equal basis with every other citizen so long as we don't have that right encumbered by voter suppression, voter intimidation, and other mechanisms that really compromise the integrity of our democracy. And one way, as you already said, EJ, to shift this democracy in the direction of more inclusivity uh, and more accessibility is to make voting a civic duty. That way all the institutions, all the state election apparatuses must meet that obligation on behalf of its state citizens and enable all of us to cast a vote freely uh, and easily. So that is obviously one of the more um, uh, transformative and novel ideas, it's novel to the US, it's not novel to many other countries around the world to have civic voting where you're compelled to at least show up and, and attempt to participate in our election. Um, but there are, more, there are simpler uh, 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 ways in which to uh, bring more people into our electorate. Automatic voter registration, which is happening in approximately 20 states across the country, is an excellent way to add more people into the, the demos, the polity, the populace that can uh, effect change in policy. The estimates that uh, AVR could increase our electorate by 22 to 27 million people. That is significant. If we ended felony disenfranchisement, we could add another six people rolls. Um, if, we, if we change early voting across the states. If we enacted, for example, the For the People Act or the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which would restore some of the critical perfection, uh, protections that we lost in 2013 in the Shelby County versus Holder case, we would bring more people into our electorate. So there are many ways at our fingertips that people have already thought of and uh, written out. And if we advocate to our elected officials that that's what we want, then hopefully we will have that and we will have greater power in our transformative right to vote. Maria Torres, I want you to come in on this, and I, I want to cast it in a particular way, if I could. We, there is a kind of vicious cycle, we saw it in some of the questions, um, where people say the system is rigged, they don't trust the system, therefore they don't vote. Uh, but then lower voter turnout leads people to say the system isn't representative, I am not uh, I am not represented. And how do we break that vicious cycle? I mean, one of the reasons I was excited that the 92nd Street Y was doing this is to remind people uh, that voting is power. It's not the only form of power in a democracy. And we have already talked about how um, you need uh, agitation, demonstrations, organizing, as well as voting uh, to bring about change. Um, but if you don't have officials elected who are prepared to respond to uh, pressure for change, you're not going to get it. How do you bust that cynicism? And I think in your work, you may encounter it less. Uh, maybe it's I'm just. Oh, you get a lot. <laughs> we get it a lot. Shooting yeah. your. Um, yeah. your kind of hopeful idealism to everyone else. But go ahead. This is, this is the thing. I, you know, I 
one of the things that I cannot stand is when people say that the system is rigged and I ask people to take a step back. I say, no, the system works as it should for those who occupy it. And our job is to make sure that young people are registered and then they occupy it. And I have to tell you that before 2018, I had nothing to point to most recently. I just had to have them give me a lot of trust that that was the case. But then 2018 happened. 2016 when it was one of the lowest participations in our elections. 2018, after a year of protest, we saw a generation of X, Y, and Z, and I could finally bring myself into that, that generation of, for the first, first time, generation X, Y, and Z outvoted older voters. And it was the highest participation in our nation's history in 100 years in a midterm. And now we actually have receipts to point to. That most diverse group of Americans voted in the most diverse Congress in our nation's history. The most women were elected, the most LGBTQ, the most veterans, some of the youngest, and some of the first Muslim American women, some of the most Native, first Native American women, the first Latinas coming out of Texas, and the list goes on. And then folks say, well, great. We, we outvoted everyone as the most diverse generation. We brought in the most diverse Congress in our nation's history. What does that prove? And this is where I make the case for di diversity. Trevor earlier mentioned the uh, H1, H1, um, HB1, HR1. House, HR1, excuse me, HR1, thank you. And that was the first piece of legislation that decided to modernize our election system because we knew that it has to be modernized for the 21st century. But then the 400 pieces of legislation that followed also spoke to our values. It addresses climate change. It addresses healthcare for women. It addresses wage parity. It addresses gun reform for the first time in 25 years. It addresses immigration and it goes on and on and on. So when people say my vote didn't matter, it's like, no, when Americans participated, we brought in a diverse Congress that was battling out ideas and passed out 400 pieces of legislation that speaks to the blueprint of America's future. And our job now is to make sure that 2018 was a dress rehearsal. For the very first time, young people will outnumber older voters by a tune of 12 million voters, two thirds of them who are young people of color. And having done this work for now 15 years, I can tell you that young people are translating protest to voting. I see it in my work every day. We did a piece of like uh, we did a survey at the end of June because we saw a huge uptick in participation that we found that 80% of young Latino voters in battleground states, 80% recognize that only way to change the system is to protest and to vote. Right. That protesting wasn't enough. In our work, when we talk to people about social justice issues, it's the third most important reason why young Latinos are heading to the polls. The alliance between African-American and Latino youth when it comes to racial inequities and profiling. And that speaks to our values and our opportunity to bring people into the fold. They may not be completely gung-ho by the presidentials, but they are starting to understand because of the great work of so many organizations connecting the DA's office. To their, to their fate, talking about school boards to their fate. Our job though, is to fill the gaps of education because sadly, EJ, as, as you know, only eight out of 50 states provide civic education in order to graduate from high school. When 51% of our children in the classroom are young kids of color and oftentimes first generation Americans, they're not learning democracy. If you were to ask me one of the first things that we should do as a country when we get in a new Congress, we need to talk about making sure that we have a uniform civic education across the board. Because if we know that the youngest generation, it also happens to be the largest generation of Americans sitting in our K through 12, and they're not getting basic civic education, we can't expect our, our country to thrive. If the premise of our country, of our democracy is maximum participation by all, we have to speak to that value at a very basic level. And that is why I was so thrilled to work with you on the Universal Voting Task Force, because I deeply believe that our maximum participation allows us to get away from the extremes and actually go back to negotiating details and legislation that promotes the interests of the country. And it's, it, uh, it, I believe, tones down the temperature of divisiveness, because all of a sudden, elected officials are not beholden to one group, 
but they're holding to a maximum group of people. And that is one of the reasons, if you were to ask me, like one of the reasons why we do have barrier participation is because the more, and this is on both sides, the more people I register, all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm held accountable to more people. That's less fun if I can only draw my attention to a few. So I encourage folks to really open up the arbiter of what does democracy look like and how do we maximize participation, not necessarily perhaps on our field models, but other countries who have done an excellent job and import those so that we can have a group of Americans that feel agency so that they are occupying the voting booth and are occupying different legislative houses so that we reflect the country we live in. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you raised civic education. I was thinking as you were talking, if knowledge is power, knowledge about how power works is really empowering. And that's yeah. part, of, uh, part of the point here. Um, and uh, I wanted to go to Trevor on this question and a, and a couple of um, related questions to kind of, and, and anyone can jump in at the end before uh, we're, we're done um, here. Uh, I'd like you to jump in on the civic education. I'd like you to talk about why we have lost um, uh, bipartisanship in reform. You know, we talked earlier about the Voting Rights Act, the 14th and 15th Amendment. That was a long time ago. The Voting Rights Act was not such a long time ago. Um, I'd like you to talk about that. And I'd like you to talk about what difference it would make on civic education itself if everyone were, if everyone voted? Because campaigns don't even reach out to those whom they have decided are non-voters. Occasionally, campaigns will try to change the electorate uh, and reach into the electorate to try to pull people in. Um, but this, again, is another what I see as vicious cycle of having lower levels of participation. Last point, I'll, I'll put it all out to you. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad Maria Teresa talked about 2018 uh, because that was really extraordinary what happened in 2018. The highest midterm voter turnout since 1914, 10 million more votes for Republicans compared to 24 years earlier, 25 million more votes for Democrats. Something happened. So in all our gloom, we should take a look and say, hey, wait a minute. Americans actually do seem to have some appreciation of what democracy can do. So you can take all of that and as the brilliant lawyer you are, wrap it into a beautiful package, Trevor. <laughs> well, thanks, EJ. I, mean, <laughs> I think there's no question that uh, even an incremental change in the number of Americans who vote can make a real difference. Uh, I mean, yes. in our recent lifetimes, uh, Obama is uh, elected over John McCain in a significant vote. Two years later, he loses Congress because his base didn't vote at the same level as angry Republicans who didn't like what was happening. Uh, you know, jump forward to 16, Hillary Clinton met her targets in Florida. The campaign was happy until they looked at the vote coming in from Trump areas, which, and Pennsylvania, where suddenly there were much larger numbers of people who had voted previously for Republican candidates uh, like Mitt Romney in 12. So a, a relatively small uh, number of new voters can make a difference, but one way or the other. The problem we face here is what I think I'd call structural barriers, uh, which, which Janae referred to and, and Maria Teresa, which is uh, the system that is set up uh, by the people in power, by legislatures, by state election officials to exclude people they don't want to vote, whom they believe to be supporters of the opposite party. In the North Carolina uh, redistricting battle, which the Campaign Legal Center took to the Supreme Court, uh, one of the pieces of evidence there was that the Republican legislators said, we weren't being anti-Black when we did this. We were trying to restrict the number of Democrats who were elected. It's not our fault that in North Carolina, most African-American voters are in fact Democrats. Uh, they were claiming for a partisan gain, but in the order to get that partisan gain, they were in fact discriminating against minorities, uh, whether it's their uh, Latinx in, in Texas and Western states, where the party in power for partisan reasons is trying to shape the electorate make it easier for their voters to vote and harder for the other side. In, in Texas, uh, where the Campaign Legal Center was counsel on the uh, uh, voting ID case, 
the Republican legislature said, we're going to count as qualified IDs uh, the concealed weapons permit holders, uh, which is a particular demographic they obviously thought was more Republican. But we're not going to allow as an ID a state issued ID from a state university because those are students and we don't think they're as likely to be our voters. So abusing the power of government to exclude people, which we have seen throughout our history, the, and this is, a, this is a racial issue, this is an economic issue, uh, it was at one stage used to try to exclude uh, Irish and Catholics from voting. Uh, we have a, a sorry history of this and we're seeing it play out today in places where the uh, political polarization mirrors a demographic polarization. And that's what needs to be addressed uh, by restoring pieces of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Janae mentioned the, the recent Florida litigation where Campaign Legal Center was counseled to uh, the 1.4 million Floridians who the, had their voting rights restored by the people of Florida. In 2018, the people of Florida by 62% amended their constitution and said, persons who are have completed their prison terms, paid their debt to society by serving time in prison and are now out and trying to be productive citizens should be encouraged to participate in our democracy. That's part of how they re-enter society, uh, feel grounded in it, uh, and become productive citizens. That was an amendment that passed with support from a number of conservatives who said for economic reasons, we can't afford as a country to have a dead weight of people who have been to prison and now have are excluded from re-entering society. So they're in a no man's land. So that's exactly the sort of thing that we're talking about all of us here in terms of broadening the franchise to people who have been excluded, making them stakeholders, having them feel that they have a investment in the country and in our system of government. So what happened? The legislature stepped in and said, we don't want those people voting. We don't think they're gonna vote for our team. And therefore they said, no, no, you have to pay the over billion dollars in fines and court costs and stenographer fees that are owed. Uh, and even worse than that, we, the state admitted under cross-examination in the, in the trial where we were representing all of those would-be voters that they couldn't tell particular individuals what they owed. So it's a catch-22. You have to pay your fines, but uh, we can't tell you what your fines are. It's outrageous. But those are the sorts of barriers, EJ, that are systemic, plus what we take for granted, but most democracies don't, a cumbersome registration system where you have two hurdles. First, you, you have to qualify to vote in terms of, of being a citizen and, and turning 18 and so forth. But then you have to do something even to have the ability to vote. So you have to go and register and that may be at a DMV or some other office, but there's an affirmative complicated action you have to take uh, in order to be qualified then to once you're registered to go through all the things we're talking about, which is making it easier to actually cast your ballot, being able to have an absentee ballot, being able to vote early, being able to vote when you're out of state, when you're off at, at school. And in many states this year, we're discovering as we look closely at it, state laws make it hard to do all of those things. Uh, Minnesota had a law that says you have to have a Minnesota voter witness your absentee ballot. So you're off in school and wherever, one of the coasts, you have to go find a registered Minnesota voter uh, in a time of COVID uh, to witness your ballot. I mean, these sorts of things make it, it really difficult. So uh, we need to look at the whole broader uh, uh, picture. And I hope that answers some of your questions. That was, a, that was wonderful. And I want to, we're, we're out of time. I'm going to just extend uh, in two ways. One is, I just uh, as we were talking, I remembered a political campaign I worked on a long time ago, decades ago. We had a, a voter registration poster. It was a little heavy handed, but I still love it. And it was a picture of Hitler, Stalin and Mao. And superimposed on their pictures were the words, people who don't care enough to vote 
can always find somebody to do it for them. Uh, and I have always thought that I, I still love that poster. It's I tweeted. I found it in my basement a, a while back. Um, but we forget how valuable liberty is and the self-government is, uh, which is why I still treasure that. I want you because you spend your life trying to remind everybody that these fights are worth it and that they can be won. And so I will put the burden on you to keep hope alive, uh, to make people out there say, yes, we can do this. And I believe we can. I am actually short term, a little gloomy, long term, quite optimistic about where we're going. Adam Serwer's great piece in The Atlantic, I think, pointed to that. I'd just like to um, ask you to uh, to uh, bring us up, to preach us uh, preach us some hope, if I may impose upon you to do that, unless you're really gloomy and then you can go there too. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for, for that opportunity. I, I think uh, Maria Teresa made the case for me in many ways by showing what the power of the vote can actually deliver and that young people are more cognizant of that than ever before. And the connection between protests and the power of the vote is clear. Um, you know, uh, someone mentioned earlier that you know, when we're talking about reforming historic endemic racism and entrenched police violence, uh, people are not only talking about protests and uh, policy reform in the abstract. They're talking about voting in the people who can act, actually make those decisions and also execute them in a way that uh, changes public safety in this country. There are roughly 2,300 sheriffs and prosecutors that are up for election this year alone. And it's those down ballot races that matter deeply to the everyday lives in some ways more than you know who is leading the country at, um, at that moment in the everyday life of people of color in particular and young people of color in this country. It is your local law enforcement uh, officer who may have more control over your freedom and over your future uh, than than anyone else uh, uh, who who you might elect at the ballot. But I will say this because I don't think I can say it better than than Thurgood Marshall, um, <laughs> who really exhorted us to take ownership of our democracy. Uh, he's the founder of the Legal Defense Fund. He has he defended voting rights throughout his career. Uh, even though most people know him for Brown versus Board of Education often hit the case he was most proud of was one out of Texas that ended all white primaries, uh, Smith versus Allwright. Um, but he said, when you see wrong, when you see injustice, when you see any, you must speak out. This is our democracy. This is our country. We make it, we protect it, and we pass it on. And it is our duty to pass on this democracy to a new generation of activists, of young people who are willing to make it better and braver and bolder than any of us could have ever done. And they are ready. They are ready and we need to support them by clearing out the brush that is in between their power and the voting booth. And there's so much that we need to contend with this particular election we have the pandemic and we have the traditional uh, measures of keeping people from the polls, but we also have a redoubling, a tripling, a quadrupling of efforts like I've never seen before. We've seen people across all industries and spectrums from celebrities to athletes to civic uh, leaders coming out to support a more engaged democracy and to ensure that we do protect our democracy and pass it on. So I will just say that I would invite everyone to have an action plan for this election that includes not only your casting a ballot, but if you're able to become a poll worker, you should go to powerthepolls.org and sign up and relieve the elder force that has protected and sustained our elections for decades who now need to be protected themselves, and we need to step in and be at the polls. I want everyone to think about how they can help transport people to the polls. 
I want everyone to think about how they can vote early to make sure that we give our election officials enough time to count the ballots and to avoid avoid the chaos that we all know could easily ensue um, in this election where we have an unprecedented volume of absentee ballots and mail-in voting. So there is something that each one of us can do to ensure that this election is not a, a dissolution of our democracy, but rather is a democracy revolution. And I firmly believe that we can do it. Amen, thank you. I just wanna say women, black Americans, working people, people without property fought for the right to vote because they knew it mattered. Other forces trying to prevent them from getting the right to vote because they knew the vote mattered. Whether the people who wanted to expand or contract democracy knew that voting mattered, and we all should too. My dear Boston Celtics are playing tonight. I took a peek, they were ahead last I looked. <laughs> and so when I say that this panel constitutes uh, the Marcus Smarts and Jason Tatums of the democracy movement, you will all know I'm giving you from the bottom of my heart a very high compliment. It's really been great to be with you all and great. And I wanna thank the 92nd Street Y for organizing this and for their whole campaign uh, to get to 100% voting. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks Bye. all who Thank joined you. us tonight as well.